morning, and welcome to Middle Sandy Evangelical Presbyterian Church, where we exist to know Christ and to make him known through the worship of God and through the preaching, teaching, and living of his infallible word by the power of the Holy Spirit. And today we really only have two announcements. The first announcement is simply what is coming up today in worship, uh, so that you'll know what, uh, um, what our passage is and our songs. Our scripture for today is Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Again, that's Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. And the two songs for today is Sing of the Lord's Goodness and Before the Throne of God Above. And the second announcement is simply to let you know that there's going to be a discussion tomorrow night uh, with the session to discuss uh, steps that we will take when it comes to reopening. Uh, we don't have a date yet. It's not necessarily going to be in May, but when we do reopen, we're going to make sure that we take measures to keep everyone safe uh, so that everyone is comfortable in worshiping together in person. So rest assured uh, that we, when we come together again, we will be safe. And so without further ado, our call to worship for today is from Revelation chapter 5, which says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them sang to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And we've come together today to sing our praises to the Lamb who was slain, Jesus Christ. And so our first song for today is Sing of the Lord's Goodness. I'm hoping you all remember this one. It was our song of the month in March. And Sing of the Lord's Goodness is taken from Psalm 93. And Elizabeth, if you're listening, play your cajon along on the refrain.
Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 13 says, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. And so now, knowing the sin that is on our hearts today and the amazing grace of our God, let us take a moment now to confess of our sins before God. Let's take a moment of silence. John writes, This is the message we have heard from God and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in God there is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. And so now we can embrace this fact, that by the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we have been forgiven. And now, let us pray as we go to our time in the Word. O oh God, send your Spirit among us as we meditate on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Lord, prepare our minds to hear your Word. Move our hearts to accept what we hear. Purify our will to obey in joy and in faith. In this we pray. Through Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. Again, our passage for today is found in the book of Colossians. This is Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. And as you're turning there, I want to note that the he that is referred to in here often is Christ. And so let us now hear from Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds, because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you have heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. And may God bless each of us richly through his holy word. Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses, Sikhs, Hindus, cults, Deists, Judaism. Do you know what each of these religious groups have in common? Our first inclination might be to say nothing, that there's nothing in common with all of them. 
Our second inclination might be to simply say that all of them are wrong, and we are right. And yet, they all believe that there is something else out there. As in there is something more to this world than just the physical, than just what we see. Each of them believe in the spiritual. And to them, I think we can add one more category called the nuns. And I don't mean nun as in N-U-N-S. I'm referring to nuns as in N-O-N-E-S. The nuns are one of the fastest growing religious groups on any census or religious survey that is taken today. The nuns are those who believe that there's something else out there, a spiritual realm, but they don't know or they won't say what it is. They aren't atheists. They aren't even agnostics. They are simply none of the above. They, like we, know that there's something out there, but they won't say what it is. Did you know that most people believe that Jesus existed? In fact, a recent uh, survey found that 92% of Americans say that they believe that Jesus lived. You know, in the Bible, we learn wisdom that stands the test of time. We learn about how to live life. But what if we stop short? A few years ago, a well-known pastor wrote a book called The Christian Atheist. And the tagline on this book was, believing in God, but living as if he didn't exist. Do we ever do that? Here's a few of the ways that this can happen. We believe in Christ, but we don't really know Christ. We believe in Christ, but we fail to pray to him, failing to see any power in prayer. We believe in him, but we fail to forgive others as he first forgave us. We believe in Jesus, but we still worry as if everything depends upon us. We believe in Jesus, but we trust more in our money for our security than in Christ. We believe in Jesus, but we don't share about him. We believe in Jesus, but we don't make his church a priority in our lives. We believe in God, but we're not sure if he loves us. Could you be a Christian atheist? Maybe you believe in Jesus when times are good, but when difficulty hits, you look to everything but Christ for your help. Today is part four in our series on the basics. The basics of Christianity. And as we've learned about the basics of Christianity, we've been, been looking at it through the lens of how it compares to Islam. There was a book written by Christian theologian R.C. Sproul and Muslim turned Christian, Abdul Salim, that we've been using to explain the differences between these two faiths. Today we talk about the deity of Christ. And not surprisingly, there's a lot of agreement about Jesus. Islam believed that Jesus lived. Islam would say that Christ was a good man and a wise teacher. But to them, he wasn't God. In fact, Muslims believe in what they call the sin of shirk. And shirk is attributing a partner to God. In saying that he was God's son, Muslims believe that Jesus committed the sin of shirk. So to a Muslim, Jesus lived he taught and he gave great wisdom, but he wasn't God's son. However, there's a problem with their view because you see, Jesus constantly taught about his father, 
in heaven. Jesus constantly referred to himself as the Son of God. And so how can someone believe that Jesus was everything but God when they believe that he was lying about one of his most foundational teachings? You can't have it both ways. He's either the Christ, the Son of God, or he's a liar who is to be written off and forgotten about. Someone unworthy of listening to or following. Abdul Salib writes that for all the agreement between Christianity and Islam, Jesus Christ is the dividing point between these two faiths. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he asked them in chapter 16, verse 14, Who do you say that I am? And that really is the question that each one of us needs to answer. How we answer it is the same between believing in Christianity or something else. C.S. Lewis has said that we must believe that Jesus is either a lunatic, a liar, others would say simply a legend, or he is Lord. Paul helps us to understand who God is by explaining who Jesus is. In the churches that Paul had established in Colossae, there was confusion over Jesus. They were confused over exactly who he was, just like so many people today can be confused over who Jesus was and what he taught and whether to trust in him. And so Paul is writing back to the Colossians after he's moved on from that area. In this letter, you can feel the passion behind Paul's words. In fact, many scholars believe that what he was including here is in fact an early Christian hymn. It's as if he's writing and saying, in Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. Except that instead of those lyrics, which are our modern lyrics, he says in verse 15, he, referring to Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. One person has illustrated this with a mirror. If somebody was sitting in the next room, you couldn't see them because of the wall that's in the way. But if there's a mirror out in the hallway, you might be able to see out the door and in the mirror, the mirror image of that person. And in the same way, Jesus is the mirror image of God. You see, in Exodus, God tells Moses that he cannot show him his whole glory or he would die. But God is a relational God. And we also, if we ever saw the full glory of God, would die. And so God has sent his son that we might see God through Christ. But there's more. Paul says in verse 16 here, all things were created by him and for him. So it's not that first there was the father and then during creation, he created his son, Jesus. No, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all part of creating this world that we live in. In the next verse, Paul refers to the preeminence of Christ, that Christ existed before all. He created the universe, he sustains it, and at the cross, he redeems it. And he redeems us. And at his resurrection, his transformed body was a glimpse into the new creation that he began. But there's even more. In verse 21, Paul writes, And you, who once were alienated, and enemies in your mind, by wicked words, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. In other words, all of our sin, all of our mistakes, our, our little white lies and our big sins, 
all of our mistakes, all those things that we wish we had not done and all the things that we regret having done, were laid upon Christ at the cross, forgiven. And now because of what he has done, we've been called and claimed as one of his own. Even more than, than wisdom and good teaching, we receive forgiveness and a clean heart. Paul then reminds us that we must continue on, continue on in the faith, and not be moved from the hope of the gospel. One of my favorite theologians has written, when somebody hears the message and believes it, what is happening is that the new creation is becoming real and actual in another instance. And so each time that we respond to Jesus' Jesus's teaching, it is his newly created order taking shape. Each time we cast our worries and anxieties on him, it is his new creation taking shape. Each time we place our confidence in Christ, rather than in our money, our employment, or our family, that is Jesus' new creation bursting forth from the tomb. Each time we not only learn the words of Jesus, but also live the words of Jesus, that is Jesus' new creation coming forth. Each time we share who Jesus is and what he has done in our lives, that is the new creation breaking forth. Each time we fall on our knees and ask God to meet our needs in Christ's name, that is the new creation being realized. Each time we forgive others because Christ first forgave us, that is new creation. Kenneth Woodward writes, the cross is what separates the Christ of Christianity from every other Jesus. In Judaism, there is no precedent for a Messiah who dies, much less as a criminal as Jesus did. In Islam, the story of Jesus' death is rejected as an affront to their God, Allah. Hindus can only accept a Jesus who passes into peaceful samadhi, a yogi who escapes the degradation of death. There is, in short, no room in other religions for a Christ who experiences the full burden of mortal existence. And hence, there is no reason to believe in him as the divine son whom the Father has resurrected from the dead. That image of a benign Jesus has universal appeal should come as no surprise. That most of the world cannot accept the Jesus of the cross should not surprise us either. Thus the idea that Jesus can serve as a bridge uniting the world's religions is inviting and impossible. For if Jesus was just a man who was either a liar a lunatic, or simply a legend in the history books, and unworthy of our trust. But in Matthew, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do you say that I am? And if he asked you that question, what would you say? Much more importantly, does your life reflect your answer to that question? Does it reflect someone whom Christ, the, Im the image of the invisible God, calls as his own? Does it reflect someone who, having been reconciled to God, now lives as a son or a daughter who reconciles with their fellow brothers and sisters? Does it reflect someone who believes in Christ, not simply as a wise teacher or an all-around great guy, truly as the Son of God. As you reflect on that, would you pray with me? Oh Lord, thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the truth that you've given us in your word of who he was, 
who he is, what he did for us 2,000 years ago, and what he means to us today. So Lord, cast out from us the temptation to be a Christian atheist. Lord, help us to not only profess our faith in him, but also to live that profession every day of our lives, in our thoughts, our words, and our actions. Oh Lord, would you draw us closer to you? Would you draw us deeper into your love? And it's in his name that we pray. now we come to the part in our worship where normally we have the opportunity to give back to God, to respond to God's word through giving. And so many have continued to respond to God's word through giving, through mailing in their donations or even dropping them off here at the church. And so let us now take a moment to pray over the generosity of God and the faithfulness of his people. Almighty God, you overwhelm us with your great mercy. At the time of our greatest need, you have surprised us with your wondrous love. Jesus has offered his life for us to remove the dreadful curse of sin in our lives. And so as you draw us into this renewing relationship of love, May we, we respond with gratitude as we offer the substance of our souls to continue the ministry of Christ here on earth. Lord, we pray over these tithes and these offerings. We pray for wisdom and for guidance for those whom you have entrusted with them. Lord, we pray for the furtherance of your gospel, for the faithfulness of your people, and the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now normally in our, our in-person worship service, we have a time in which we come together and we share the praises and the requests that are on our hearts. And so as we've done many weeks, I'd like to invite you again to our Thursday night prayer time on Facebook Live, where you can share the praises and the requests that are on your hearts, and we can offer them up to the Lord together. And so now, would you join me again in our pastoral prayer? Oh Lord, we give thanks this morning for the beautiful creation that we can enjoy. We thank you for caring and for providing for your people. Oh Lord, we give thanks for your gift of Jesus and for the hope that you have offered us through him. For Lord, in this time of the coronavirus, we look to you for your grace, your healing, and your joy. Lord, the need that surrounds us is astounding. And yet you are far greater. And so we look to you. We give thanks for the essential workers, the first responders, the health care providers, and the military who continue to serve in spite of the stay-at-home orders. Lord, we continue to pray for a vaccine. We continue to simply pray for the coronavirus to end. Lord, we look to you to provide out of your abundant blessings provision for all those who are struggling today. Not only economically, Lord, but spiritually, mentally, and relationally. Lord, we think today 
of the unemployed, the lonely, the hungry, and those who do not believe. Lord, we lift them up to you and pray that we might be a part, that we might be your hands and feet, caring for others. Lord, we pray for the furtherance of your gospel in these days. We pray for your church here in Homeland, that you would empower your people to love, to serve, and to care for those around us. Lord, help us to be a shining light in the darkness. And as organizations start to reopen, we pray for your protection, protection from the further spread of the coronavirus. Lord, we also pray for the government officials, knowing that in Romans, Paul tells us that a government official is God's servant for your good. And so we pray that you would work through those at the federal, state, and local levels, that your servants would be given wisdom and guidance from you for the tough decisions that are still ahead of them. Oh Lord, we give you thanks for your gift of worship this morning, that we can celebrate the empty tomb and the indwelling Holy Spirit. Lord, draw us close to you, that we might experience your love and your intimacy. Lord, empower us for service and mission. All of this in your name. Amen. Our closing song for today is Before the Throne of God Above. You may remember that this was our song of the month in February, and um, it was written in Ireland by a woman named Charity Lee Bancroft. And the overall theme of this hymn is the character and nature of God. Christ as our advocate and our intercessor before God the Father. Because as Pastor Mark said this morning, when we try to become our own Savior by navigating this life in our own strength, then we will find ourselves in a sinking ship. Jesus is sufficient at all times and in all circumstances. He is our great high priest, therefore we have the ability to draw near to the throne of grace with confidence. Thank you. 
Amen. Aren't BJ and Linda wonderful? You know, I, you know, earlier on in this, I kept encouraging you to react to comments, to let the, the comments and the, the reactions in your Facebook feed be a part of your worship. So I want to ask you right now, would you send those two some love in that video? Because those two do so well. Okay, would, would you send them some love there? And then afterwards, I look forward to seeing the things you say about how wonderful these two are. And Lord willing, one day soon the entire choir can be a part of this. So thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, BJ. You're welcome. I feel like today has been especially <laughs> wonderful. Okay, without further ado, thank you for joining us in our time of worship. Christ has come. Christ is risen. And today we can celebrate the empty tomb. Would you receive the blessing? as we depart. May the God of love, who shared his love, strengthen us in our love for others. May the Son, who shared his life, grant us grace, that we might share our life. And may the Holy Spirit, dwelling in us, empower us to be only and always for others. Amen. Have a great week.